You bet. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Diego. And, and thank you all for attending the webinar. Uh, it's my name is Ethan Bredemeyer and, and Kim Harris, as well as Diego mentioned, we're both with AgriLogic. It's a great kickoff series, Winning at Risk Management. Uh, part one, we're going to talk about whole farm revenue protection and the micro farm programs. And we'll go into more detail of that. But it's going to be a four part webinar series that we're looking at. Uh, thank you again for joining, for joining the first one. It's been a great opportunity and we'll talk more about uh, what, what we're doing in the series and then we'll dive into uh, whole farm revenue protection. I want to say real quick, veteran, veteran farmers and ranchers and those that are attending that are veterans, thank you for your service. I don't think y'll get thanked enough. Um, it's a great opportunity and, and, and greatly appreciate all that you've done for our country. So I wanted to start with that. And then I'm going to roll into a real serious question that we have here, two serious questions to get get us kicked off. I hope these webinars are more interactive. Um, I like to see an interaction. It's, it's kind of hard to, to see people face to face whenever you're looking at a computer. And so try to have a little more interactive accessibility through these components. So I'm going to get started with two real serious questions. And I hope you can see that. Um, but the first question is crunchy or creamy peanut butter. Kim and I have been fighting this, fighting this question back and forth. Um, so, so crunchy or creamy peanut butter. And then the second question is a little more serious. Did you attend the Crop Insurance 101 webinar or any of the in-person sessions that we've had over the last three months? I'll give oh, you yeah. all just a second to answer those questions. See, Ethan, like I told you that crunchy was the way to go. Man, you know, sometimes <laughs> I, I, I keep telling Kim that I, it's it's kind of crunchy. It's kind of like ice cream. I, I like my peanut butter like my ice cream, real creamy and, and nice yeah. and sweet that way. But Neither it does me. look like crunchy's taking the lead right now on that one. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, creamy. and, and, and uh, you want to go creamy too, Diego? Yeah, go creamy, yeah. There you yeah. go. There you go. Yeah. Oh, Rocky Road. There you go. Ice Rocky cream. Ice See? Cream. Oh, there's a few. Rocky exceptions. Road's one of my favorites too. And there's a reason. It's got, it's got some texture to it. I was obsessed with rock and roll as a kid. <laughs> well, we're getting close, and it looks like we'll we'll stop there. It looks like Crunchy's kind of taking the lead. Oh yeah. Uh, well, Kim Kim wins again. Kim <laughs> wins again. We won't talk that. about my uh, NCAA pick, will we? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll leave the bracket challenge alone for now on that <laughs> one. Um, and then it looks like about two thirds of y'all have not attended any of the Crop Insurance 101. So welcome. Thank you for for. Uh, Bringing in, this is all a little newer. We'll highlight some of those that we talked about in the Crop Insurance 101. I um, mean, some of y'all that attended, y'all will see some of the similar content, um, but then we'll dive into a little more detail on whole farm. So and then also, feel free to ask questions throughout the, uh, in the chat or Q&A, and we'll answer them as we go. So, yeah. Absolutely. And so, we'll go into this. So, if I can monitored in a couple of, here we go. So AgriLogic Consulting, who are we? We're a agricultural economic and insurance consulting firm. Our big priority um, that we spend a lot of our time on is research and development of crop insurance programs and risk management tools uh, that's available for the, for the American agricultural producer. And we're looking at, of uh, course, Farmer Veteran Coalition. Diego will highlight some of this uh, at the end of the presentation, but great organization that we've partnered with uh, we also do risk management education, which is why we're here today. And we'll highlight some of those different things that we, uh, uh, this program, we get to talk about the different risk management tools that are available uh, to producers. And the Farmer Veteran Coalition is a great resource to use. They have a lot of awesome resources and programs that they're doing as well. And so great opportunity to work with Diego and, and his team as well. And then uh, the USDA risk management agencies who fund uh, this webinar and the webinars that are to come, I believe Bill was uh, going to try to attend today. I don't know if he's on or not. Uh, thank you to Bill and uh, Bill Ferris and, and Brian and Chola as well for all of their work and dedication towards, towards this project. So Crop Insurance 101 summary. As we know, farming is a risky business. And when we start looking and taking the, the 30,000 foot approach, risk is made up of severity and frequency. And there's three main ways that we can mitigate risk when we start talking about risk management. We can, we can reduce the severity, we can reduce the frequency, or that third task is we can transfer a portion of that risk to a different entity, such as an insurance company, which is where we have insurance from. 
as, as we talk about when we're starting to look at natural causes of loss, such as tornado and hurricanes and, and hailstorms, it's real hard to, to stand outside your front porch until that hurricane, you, you need to stop. You need to stop. You can't, can't really reduce that severity or frequency to naturally occurring events. Um, and so that leaves you with that third, that third option, which is to transfer a portion of that risk over um, into something such as crop insurance. When we look into crop insurance, there's federal programs and private programs. Uh, a lot of the federal programs uh, cover multiple perils. Uh, where a lot of our private programs are, are like we have crop hail, uh, there's a crop hail products um, that a lot of private companies uh, administer and sell. And so that's covering hail damage. Uh, the federal policies, a lot of those for the most part, uh, cover a, a diverse, uh, a widespread amount of causes of loss and perils. Also federal crop insurance is backed and subsidized by the federal government. Um, but those programs are administered by private insurance companies. And like I said, there's numerous insurance programs. There's a ton of different products that are out there now uh, that are available to the agricultural producer. When we start categorizing those, we can look into four big buckets. Uh, what happens on your operation? So that's your individual base. What happens in your area? So there's your area base. And then there's a blend between those two. And then there's a parametric index or, or a rainfall index that goes in there as well. So today we're going to dive into whole farm revenue protection. You'll also hear me refer to that as whole farm. Um, also WFRP is utilized throughout this presentation. I know a, a lot of the veterans out there are, utilize, are used to, to acronyms. So used to that um, crop, to answer that question that I saw pop up, uh, when I talk about crop, I also mean commodities. So cattle is included in that, uh, livestock products as well. Um, so when we, like I said, we're really using commodity um, that are available out there to livestock programs as we'll dive into on, I think, part four of the webinar series. We'll go into more of the livestock side, um, but it is available as well for those for, for livestock. Also, when I talk crop commodity, I'm using those interchangeably. We're going to discuss. And don't very, tune out if you're a cattle grower because the whole farm does have um, coverage for livestock. So. Absolutely. And that crop insurance 101 webinar, we had a webinar and then in person sessions, Kim and myself and, and another one of our policy analysts traveled um, across the country. We went to Texas, North Carolina and Tennessee. And uh, we talked to and, and there was a lot of goats that I realized a lot of goats and, and, and a lot of bees, I feel like as well. And so when, when we're talking about crop bee guys are included. So stay tuned because whole farm kind of highlights all of these different commodities, which is a great way to I feel like this was a great way to kick off uh, this series is with whole farm and micro farm. And then we'll provide some examples of how these operate. So real quick on benefits for veteran farmers and ranchers, uh, need to be an individual who served in active duty, uh, were discharged under conditions other than dishonorable, and then qualify under one of these three categories. So first, have you operated a farmer ranch before? If you have, um, we'll go to the second, the second qualification. If you have not, you qualify as a veteran farmer and rancher. All right, second qualify. I've operated a farm and ranch, but have I operated it for not more than five years? So less than five years, I qualify. Uh, more than five years, I got to drop down to that third tier, which is have I obtained a veteran status during the most recent five-year period, um, even if I have operated that farm and ranch. So it's kind of a three-tier approach on qualifications. First, if you haven't qualified, I mean, if you haven't operated a farmer ranch, second of all, um, if you've operated it for less than five years, or if you've obtained, if you operated more than five years, did you obtain your veteran status during the most recent five year period? Businesses will qualify um, if all entities or, or parties that are have a, a substantial beneficial interest uh, qualify as veteran farmer and rancher. So therefore, um, if, if, I go in it personally with a buddy of mine who uh, just became a veteran. If we're partners on a farmer ranch um, or agricultural operation, we do not qualify because I'm not a veteran, um, but he, even though he does qualify. However, spouses, so my buddy, if, if he's about to start and him and his wife are starting an operation, he still qualifies as a veteran farmer and rancher because a spouse does not, does not count in that, in that entity. So what are our benefits? So the first thing, if you qualify, uh, you're exempt from administrative fee on CAT and buy-up coverage policies. And so when we're looking at uh, catastrophic, um, catastrophic policies, that's about $655 is what that administrative fee is. 
our buy-up coverage policies, we're looking at $30 a policy per crop per county. And so you're exempt from those fees as a veteran farmer and rancher. There's an additional 10% premium subsidy. Uh, so give you an example, a, a typical schedule, a lot of guys on, on if you're electing like a 65% coverage level, uh, the federal government's gonna subsidize 59%. Um, so we're gonna bump that up as a veteran farmer and rancher, another 10%, so 69%. And you sit there and go, well, 10% is not a lot, but when you start putting the pencil to it, um, it all adds up at the end of the day. Then you also have the ability to use a previous producer's production history. So if you uh, join the military and then become a veteran and you're going back to the family farm, you can utilize uh, your, your dad or granddad, their producer records, as long as they approve of that and, you're in, and you were involved in that operation uh, prior, prior to going um, in the military. And then you increase the substitute yield adjustment. This is a tool that is utilized so we talk about transitional yield. So if you go in with, there's some programs that uh, you may not have any records for. Basically, instead of they use 60%, they'll bump that up to 80%. And, and uh, we won't go quite into details um, for the whole farm purposes, but also later we'll talk a little more about this yield, set, uh, yield adjustment that's utilized. But basically, instead of 60% of the transitional yield, uh, we'll bump that up to 80%. So beginning farmer and rancher, same exact benefits as we saw on the veteran side. You must have operated a farm and ranch for no more than five crop years. As we're talking about whole farm, that's actually 10 crop years. Uh, crop years are excluded uh, if you were under 18, enrolled in post-secondary studies or in active duty. So if I started to farm and ranch with my dad at 16, I went 16, 17, uh, those two years do not count when I become 18. That's when my crop years are starting to count for beginning farmer and rancher. And you must be an individual, uh, again, like veterans. If you start a business with different uh, beneficial interest holders, they must all qualify as beginning farmer and rancher as well. Limited resource farmer and oh, rancher. Before you, before you move on there, Ethan had a quick question about if still on active duty. And, and I was kind of looking at the language just to make sure it says, and it says you must have served. So if you're still on active duty, you would qualify for the veteran farmer and ranger. Absolutely. Yes, exactly right. And that's that's interesting. Go ahead, Kim. Oh, no, I just wanted to add that in there before we moved on to the next spot. So. Very good. Absolutely. Absolutely. So limited resource farmer and rancher available for those who have uh, gross farm sales less than the current index value, which is 221,000 uh, for the 2023 commodity year. And you had to have been below that in each of the previous two years. And then if your household income is below the national poverty level for a family of four or less than 50% of the median household income over the, over the last two years. And there's a lot of different programs and benefits available if you, if you reach that category. There is a determination tool USDA publishes. That's a great tool to utilize as well uh, to see if you qualify or not for that. But there are benefits available for you. With that, uh, we'll start rolling into whole farm and micro farm. Are there any other questions, Kim? Nope, I don't see any other than is that your barn? Th that is not my barn. That is not my barn, un unfortunately. I, I thought that was a really, really neat barn. Uh, mm -hmm. That we had a, a analyst uh, went to an operation, and that was that was their that was their barn that they kept. I think they use it more for picture purposes than utilization. Mm -hmm. But I always think that's a really really neat picture. And and to get started, as we can admire that real quick, and have a quick question for all of you, quick quick pop quiz, I guess we can call. Do you qualify as a beginning farmer and rancher, or a veteran farmer and rancher, or a limited resource farmer and rancher? Or do you qualify as more of the above or, or do you not qualify or, or hopefully do you still not have an idea if you qualify or not? And we'll give you just a second and I'll grab me a quick drink of water and see how that poll goes. We'll end it there. Looks like we have all I think I can share the results on this one. 
So beginning farmer and rancher, we have uh, looks like two, and then we got several veterans, several more than one of the above. Um, still no idea we have four. I, I understand. I know we, we go through that quick and, and there's a lot of different uh, availabilities and, and some different things you got to look at. Good thing to do, and we talk about this a lot, is, is be sure to contact your crop insurance agent or find a crop insurance agent. They can help you on those qualification processes. Yeah, because if you can imagine, um, federal crop insurance is run by the federal government, so it operates, operates similar lead to the military from what I can understand and uh, from what my son has told me that's in the military. Uh, we live and die by the acronyms and for every rule, there's an exception to the rule. So um, it's really important to, to make sure that you find a good agent to help you with that. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Kim was a Kim was a crop insurance agent for, for many, many years and, and uh, she trained a lot of insurance agents. And so she's a, she's a great resource. It's helped me a lot and, and she can talk. You, you need to make sure you Talk to somebody that has the heart of a teacher and uh, be good from there. All right, let's dive more into whole farm and micro farm policies. So when we're looking at whole farm and micro farm over the 2022 commodity year, uh, if you can look here, you see that whole farm definitely has, has, is dominating over micro farm if you were comparing the two. However, I will say uh, micro farm was released in 2022. So this was, this was its first year out of the gate uh, whole Farm was released in 2015, and so there's probably a little bit of a, of a catch up there, and that's why you see some of that spread. When we look at it on a state basis, the thing to remember here, a uh, thing to highlight, if you're in any of the 50 states, you have Whole Farm and Micro Farm in your area. You're, it is available in all 50 states and in all counties in those 50 states. If we look at it from a liability perspective, we're looking at Washington, California, and Idaho out there west. Y'all dominate the gold, silver, and bronze and whole farm. And then we'll flip over to the east coast, North Carolina and Florida, uh, finish out fourth and fifth. Micro farm, we're looking at Michigan and Colorado. Y'all are the, the two big, uh, Michigan definitely over half a million in liability. Um, in Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, and Tennessee wrap out the top five. But if you are in any of the 50 states, you qualify under whole farm. And, and micro farm, those are all available in your area. Some dates to, to utilize. So you see we have early fiscal year filer and late fiscal year filer. So if, you're, if you have a physical year, if you don't go off of calendar year, which is Jan 1 to December 31st, if your physical year is before September 1, you're uh, classified as an early fiscal year filer. Uh, September 1 and later, you're a late fiscal year filer. So those are our dates. The important ones to highlight is sales closing. We're looking at a 131, uh, 228 or 315. All depends on, on what area you're in. Goes back to contact your crop insurance agent and, and uh, determine uh, what is the sales closing for, for your specific county. Late fiscal year filers is November 20th of the prior year. So we know these are dates are already past us, but give you that knowledge and, and it'll be next year will be here before you know it. Um, revised farm operation report. Basically, there's there's a intended, revised, and then final farm farm operation report that whole farm and micro farm, farm go off of. 715 is the date for that. And then uh, there's contract change date. That's basically for the policy side to make sure the policy is final for that year. And then our insurance year is either the calendar year or fiscal year uh, that's applicable for your operation. All right, whole farm revenue protection. Basically, it's a risk management safety net that covers all your commodities on your operation under one policy. If those commodities bundled up together, and if all those bundled up together fall below your guarantee, um, a loss has occurred and a payment is possible. The thing on whole farm revenue protection is that your post-production and value added cost. So I'm gonna use the example of peaches. There's peach preserves is, is a great, thing that, that I love to death every morning for breakfast on a, on a warm biscuit. Peach preserves are pretty good. If I'm making those preserves, the, the cost it takes to jar and, and, and can and do that process is not included as my approved revenue. We have to back those out on whole farm. Micro farm, they will be included, um, but whole farm, they will not be. There is- A quick question. Ready. When was the last time you made peach preserves? 
Never, never. Oh, okay. Never. You just said I'm making. I was just curious. No, oh. no I, I usually do more of the consuming and taste testing on my peach preserves more than I do the making. That was that was more of my grandmother's side to, to take care of that. But uh, no, that like I said, those are the great great things to utilize. Um, going back in here, uh, farms up to 17 million in insured revenue. So the highlight here is insured. So for some reason, if, if my farm is doing really well and I'm making $34 million, I can only elect a 50% coverage level. So 34 million times 50%, that gives me that 17 million that I'm capped at. Um, like I said, that coverage level determines how that translates. Timber, forest, forest products, any of your show animals or, or exhibition animals, and then pets are not included under whole farm. So we can't, we can't insure your dogs and your cats. Um, but the commodities purchased for resale will eat, can equal up uh, no more than 50% of your expected revenue. So those products are ineligible. Our animal and animal products were capped that at $2 million, uh, greenhouse and nursery. So we're looking at plants on this. Uh, so like if you were selling tomato plants, you're capped at 2 million. Uh, tomatoes are, are, are not capped at that, but we're looking at the plant when we talk about greenhouse and nursery. You can buy a whole farm with other buy-up federal uh, multi peril crop insurance policies. And you can, if not cat, cat is not eligible um, on buy-ups, but you can elect other buy-up policies. And then those indemnities that you receive off of that will be considered revenue to account for whole farm. And then replant coverage except hemp and those covered by other federal uh, crop insurance policies are, are, is available under whole farm. So micro farm, we hear micro farm, micro farm, what is it? It's a more streamlined approach to whole farm, uh, mainly targets small producers and a lot of our, uh, we know urban agriculture is popping out. And so this is targeting those and, and those smaller producers. There's not quite as much paperwork that we see in whole farm. So that's a, that's a great benefit that we see. As we go back talking about the, my peach preserves, those post-production costs and value added costs that you're making to increase that value, those can be included in our approved revenue. Insured operations with approved revenue up to $350,000 for the initial year. And then if you roll over to the next year, they bump that up to 400,000. Of course, same thing, timber, our show animals, those are in pets are not uh, eligible for micro farm. And then resale can equal up to 50% as well. You, uh, if you're vertically integrated or have other crop insurance policies, so those are eligible for whole farm, but you're not eligible under micro farm. And then no replant coverage is available. Go back and highlight that, that second box that we have here on value added cost. So like I said, whole farm, I have to back those out. There are market ready costs. So we use that example of peaches. I have to get the peaches out and, and washed and make sure they're good to sell. Um, but anything used to increase the value, such as putting it in preserves or, or a jelly or a jam, uh, it can, that is only included under micro farm and not whole farm. So what's the information that we need? Well, we're looking at tax forms, that Schedule F tax form. Uh, I, I did my taxes about two weeks ago, and so I'm a little more familiar with it now. It's fresh on my mind. Uh, but five years for whole farm is what we're looking at. Beginning or veteran farmers and ranchers, you only have to report three of those uh, tax schedule Fs in, in your tax forms. And then micro farm is three years as well. If uh, you have, if you file other tax forms, uh, farm tax forms, depending on whatever the case may be, you have not filed taxes or, or you're a tax exempt entity and have uh, acceptable third party records or substitute schedule F form, which is essentially the same Schedule F form, you just didn't submit that to the IRS due to whatever the case may be, uh, those are available. And then the big thing to highlight here, our 2023 uh, in the change for whole farm, uh, there used to be expense reporting, allowable expense reporting that went to a lot of detail in another form that had to be filed that is no longer required for whole farm. So they've, they've helped reduce the paperwork um, that's necessary for that. So that was a big highlight to have if, if you've already been through the whole farm process. All right, what are we looking at coverage? So our approved revenue is determined on that farm operation report that we were talking about. And it's either the lower of our expected revenue or that 
historical average. So the last five years or three years, we're taking the average of that and whichever one's the lower of what am I expected to make this year or whatever the lower, uh, either the lower of whatever I'm supposed to produce that year or whatever my average is based on those Schedule F forms. It is important to note that when we're talking about revenue produced during the insurance period, when we're looking at that, I, I think cattle is usually a good commodity to utilize when we're talking about this. So in, if my, I produced my cattle last year, well, if I produced them last year and then I sold them this year, well, the stuff that's harvested or produced last year is what's accounting for that um, for that prior year. It's not included in, in the year that I actually sell. However, let's say in Jan, uh, January 1, I have um, each calf is worth $800. They're, they're stocker calves at this time. They're worth $800. I'm going to feed them out and sell them at the end of the year. So I, I feed them out, start at $800. And then whenever I feed them out, that's about $1,300. So that revenue that I'm looking at for that year is $500, if that makes sense. Uh, Whole Farm has inventories and, and accounts receivable that paperwork they utilize for that to make those adjustments and make sure that things are, are working um, as planned. But basically is what I am producing that year is what counts for my expected revenue. And in that insured revenue, so is the approved revenue, which is the less of your expected or average times our coverage level. So coverage levels are available from 50 to 85%. Again, cat coverage is not available for whole farm or micro farm. And then my 80 to 85% coverage levels are only available for micro farm or whole farm if my commodity count is three or more. We'll talk more about commodity count for whole farm in just a second. But the important thing to highlight here is that micro farm, you're automatically eligible for that 80 to 85 percent coverage levels. Whole farm, I need to have a commodity count of three or more. All right, so price is determined by what a producer can expect to receive um, when it's harvested. So basically, the, the highlight here in yield is the same thing as well. Basically, we're looking at whether it's a marketing contract or we're looking at third party, disinterested third party records of what prices are for apples. If you produce apples or eggs or whatever, whatever commodity you're looking at, basically, they're trying to make sure that those prices are verified and those yields are verified as what is appropriate for my area. I, I will highlight a good example I thought about is out in West Texas. If, if for some reason you put cotton under whole farm, uh, out in West Texas, we're making maybe two thirds, three quarters of a bale. So if somebody's trying to put two and a half bale cotton, um, good luck. We need to we need to reevaluate that or see what your production operations are um, in order to see that. So yield, like I said, they're looking at appropriate, making sure that those data sources for yield and price um, are credible and, and trustworthy, and making sure that all all is appropriate as planned. And then in micro farm, so whole farm is a line by line, commodity by commodity. Micro farm, we get to bundle that up and your expected values and yields are get to put that all, re, uh, you don't have to do the, the commodity by commodity line items such as whole farm. So what are our adjustments when we talk about different types of adjustments? So on our historical average, if the last two years, so if we have five years of tax forms, the last two years, are higher than my simple average, they do a trend factor and a calculation that goes with that to increase that next or to increase your average up um, because you're, it looks like you're a growing operation. Every year you're doing better and better. And so they have an indexing process for that. And then expanding operations, uh, you're up to 35% growth uh, above your historical average. If you, if so, a good example here is I have an operation and I, bought another uh, farm that's 100 acres. If I can show however much growth, I'm capped at 35% of that growth. Um, but that's usually where we see that is like added land or any type of increase in, in your production systems. If it's solely due to certified organic production, it's the higher of 35% or $500,000, which is a big, uh, big benefit for those guys who are, are producing organic production. We won't dive too much into the weeds here, but basically I've, I remember in Tennessee, we had the question of, of what happens, you know, I've, I've had some really bad years over my average when we're looking at that historical average, 
Well, there's some options that are available. There's this 90% approved revenue cup. And, and Kim might have to help me a little more here because she, she probably knows it on the back of her hand more than I do. But the 90%, basically, from what I can tell, if my average last year, uh, whatever, so I have my average to the prior year for Whole Farm. When we start that next upcoming year, and I still elect Whole Farm, that prior, let me rephrase, excuse me, let's take a step back. I started out Whole Farm, have my average revenue over the last five years. That year was a really bad year, and I didn't produce very much at all, way below my average. For the next following year, instead of that average calculating and dropping my overall historical average, I can take 90% of that approved revenue, so the prior five years, and I get to utilize that um, instead, of, instead of calculating, so it helps keep your, keep your average and keep your guarantee a little higher than what it, what it could have been if you incorporate that bad year from the previous year. Yeah, what also, it's basically doing is it's, it's, it's stopping your approved revenue from dropping more than 10% from one year to the next. Correct. Exactly. So if you have a bad year, it doesn't drop your overall average 50%. It can't drop it more than 10%. Exactly right. Revenue exclusion. So five years, if one of those years was really, really bad, I can exclude that from my average. And then when we're looking at revenue substitution, uh, it's basically 60% of your average allowable revenue. So I have my average 60% of that. If any of those five years is below that 60%, I get to use that 60% average to help keep that boosted up as well. Um, so that's, that's some different options that are available. Essentially, in summary, the best thing to highlight here is that if you have a bad year, there are some, some tools available to help keep those averages where it doesn't, it doesn't really kill on your average revenue. So commodity count, we've talked about commodity count. It helps if you're available for that 80 to 85% coverage level. It, uh, the approved amount of premium rate discount and your subsidy factor are all determined by this commodity count. And then if you grow potatoes or you have other revenue programs of, um, that you've elected, you need to make sure that commodity count is above one, it has to be two or greater. So when we look at that from a, from a commodity count standpoint, we look at these subsidy factors so we can see that when I go from one to two, my subsidy factor increases tremendously. And then whenever I have three or more, I get eligible for that 80 and 85% coverage level for whole farm. Again, reminder, micro farm, you already start at the commodity, the subsidy factors that on that, lap, that bottom of that table that we see for micro farm, you're already eligible for that. So how do we calculate commodity count? It's not determined by the number of commodities produced, but through a calculation. So we produce, let's say, pecans, bees, hay, and then we also have cattle as well. Our expected revenue is $26,000. We can see we produced four commodities. However, we have to go through a calculation. So the first step is you take one divided by the number of commodities produced. So we have a quarter. You take that quarter and you multiply it by a third. So that gives us a 12th. We're going to take that 12th and we're going to multiply it by our total expected revenue of $26,000. And we see we have a little over $2,100. And as we can see, anything above that $2,100 threshold qualifies as a commodity. So cattle and hay both qualify. However, bees and pecans do not because they are below that $2,100 threshold. However, we're going to bundle those commodities that did not um, did not qualify. We're going to bundle that total together on this last step. So that totals to $2,200, $2,250, and we're going to divide it by that threshold, and we, we have a little bit above one, and we'll add that one along with our hay and our cattle, and we have a commodity count of three. So that's how the calculation steps work. Um, basically, they make sure that you have uh, above that whatever that threshold is, and then you bundle those commodities that do not fall under that threshold, um, divide and, and add those two together and that's your commodity count. So causes of loss, adverse weather, which includes tornado, fire, hurricane, blizzard, et cetera, and so forth. Uh, of course, fire, insects, plant or animal disease, earthquake, volcanic eruption, failure of irrigation water supply, wildlife, and then a decline in market price. You see some of that, I call it the fine, the fine font. 
that we see here. Um, basically, you need to make sure that good farming or ranching practices are utilized. Drought is included under adverse weather. Um, it's better to highlight adverse weather and, and utilize that from a policy standpoint rather than trying to go with each one because there's a lot of different a lot of different causes. Um, but basically, naturally occurring events or a decline in market price. Like I said, that fine font that we see, make sure your good farming and ranching practices are being utilized. So claim settlement. So we had a, a cause of loss happen. We had a tornado hit. We had a hailstorm hit. We file a notice after that occurs with our agent. After we file taxes for that policy year, we're going to see whatever your revenue to count is for that year. And if, you're, if your revenue to count is below your guarantee, a payment is likely to occur. And those are all, again, based on your Schedule F tax forms. Adjustments, we keep talking about the adjustments and, and highlighted that. So if I sold something that previous year that was produced the prior year, we're going to back that out of your revenue to count. However, if you have produced something that year but have not sold it yet, we're going to add that to your revenue to count. So go back to that example of cattle. I had some calves that were born uh, two year, uh, last year, but I sold them this year. Well, we're going to back that out. Um, there's some growth metrics, of course, that we talked about as well. But then if I had calves born this year, but I haven't sold them yet, those will be added to my revenue to count. And then anything that was an uninsured cause of loss, um, if, if my goats got out and, and, and got ran over or whatever the case may be, um, there'll be an adjustment to make sure that, that that is not accounted for or that is accounted for, excuse me. All right, that is whole farm and micro farm. In summary, that is a lot of information that we've, we've highlighted here. As Kim and, Kim and I look at the questions, I wanna send out a couple of, another poll question that we will launch. So first of all, is micro farm and whole farm available in your area? I hope, I hope we have 100% correct answers on that one. Second question, which program allows you to elect individual crop policies at the buy-up coverage level? So is that whole farm or micro farm? And then what best describes whole farm and micro farm? And then those are your options there. So kind of a pop quiz before we go into the examples and resources and, and wrap this webinar up. Kim, do we want to touch on some questions as well while, while we're getting these uh, questions answered? I think we've been covering them as we go. I don't see any new ones, so. Awesome. You've done a great job. You've explained everything they ever needed to know. Great. And we're looking good. We're, we're answering the right questions here. I'll give us about 10 more seconds. Yeah, we'll put together, uh, I just wrote a note here, we'll put together a PDF of this so that you can kind of read it. And then also, Diego, if I remember right, you guys are recording this so that you will provide a link to the recording as well if they want to go back and, you know, some night they've got insomnia and need something to do. There you go. Crop insurance puts you sleep right away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, it's, it's we try to, like I said, from, from peanut butter to talking about peach preserves, we try to add some things because if we just talked about crop insurance straightforward, um, I, I think we might fall asleep, fall asleep while talking at the same time. All right, I'll end the poll there and share the results. All right, so first question is, whole farm and micro farm programs available in your area? We had one person select no. If, if, if you're in the 50 states, you do qualify. So I don't know, I don't know where, our, where our one may be located at, um, but great job on that question. Second question, which program allows you to elect individual crop policies at buy-up coverage levels? If you answered whole farm, you got that question correct. Um, micro farm, y'all may be a part of our crunchy peanut butter crew as well on that one, but, but whole farm, you are eligible for buy-up coverage levels. Micro farm, you are not eligible to elect other crop insurance policies. So what best describes whole farm and micro farm? Um, out of those options, it looks like 94% got the correct answer that we're looking at all commodities on our farm underneath one policy. That's the best way to summarize whole farm and micro farm. Uh, only livestock, that was kind of a trick, trick answer that I put there. Um, livestock is included under whole farm, um, but there's crops and trees and, and a lot of other different types of commodities that are included for whole farm as well. So great job. I think that that helps that we've been informative and, and have been 
hopefully interactive and, and beneficial throughout this session. We're gonna go through a couple of quick examples and resources and then we'll be wrapped up and I'll let Diego talk a little bit about the Farmer Veteran Coalition. So let's go into our example here in Polk County, North Carolina. We have a producer uh, sales closing dates 228 for Whole Farm in Polk County. Our approved revenue, we see peaches, eggs, poultry, and goats. Those are our following amounts that totals to $25,000 in our expected revenue. We're gonna take that commodity count again for Whole Farm. We're gonna take one divided by the number of commodities. We're gonna multiply that by a third, which equals a 12th. We're gonna take that 12th and multiply it by our, the $25,000. So we're looking at a $2,075 threshold. If we can look here, eggs qualify, poultry qualifies, goats qualify. However, peaches are below that $2,000 mark, and so they do not. We take that four step, you take that $1,000 divided by 2075, and we're still falling short on that, so that's a zero. So zero plus three, our commodity count is three. And just to make sure no one misunderstands, peaches will still be covered. They're just not part of the commodity. They just don't count as a commodity when it comes to determining numbers, but they still do have coverage. Yes, exactly correct. Great job, Kim. And, and that's, like I said, going back to that subsidy factor. So we see that we're three and above. So we have that, uh, the subsidy schedule for three or more commodities. And then there's a premium rate discount that we didn't really highlight quite as much um, when we were going through that slide. But basically up until there's a calculation uh, posted in the special provisions for Whole Farm. And when you're up to seven, I believe seven and greater has the same formula, but there's a formula that will help uh, discount that premium rate. Why is that? Well, we're looking at risk. And as we can tell, if I just produce goats versus producing eggs, peaches, poultry, and goats, uh, my risk is more spread out. Uh, the old saying goes, I have more eggs, eggs in different baskets. And so that's why we have that. Um, and that's why that we have this commodity count formula. So go back to their example. We elect the 80% coverage level because we qualify and, and we feel like that's going to mitigate the risk that we need. So our expected revenue multiplied by our coverage level, we're looking at $20,000. That year was a real bad year. We had, um, you know, whatever the case may be, or we, we had excessive wind and knocked all of our peaches down. Um, goats, we, we, we had a wild thing occur and our, our goats got, had, uh, got struck by lightning or Whatever the case may be, there's a lot of different scenarios that could pop up, but we're looking at $10,000 for that crop year. We take the 20,000 minus the 10,000, and we're looking at a $9,600 indemnity. Hope, that's, hope that is clear as mud, um, or maybe a little clearer than mud, but that's kind of how whole farm works. Micro farm is almost the exact same, um, except we do not see this commodity count calculation. So we're gonna go up to Adams County, Washington, um, and the producer there elected micro farm coverage by the 315 sales closing date. So he elected the 65% coverage level. We see these are his commodities, apples, cut flowers, and bees um, in, in Washington. So we have those amounts. Our total expected revenue is $11,000. We're going to take that and multiply it by our coverage level, which is 65%. So that leaves us a little above $7,100 in insured revenue. Our revenue to count for that year. So uh, we had a bad freeze hit and hurt our bees or, or in, in our apples as well, uh, whatever the case may be. Again, naturally occurring causes of loss. Maybe we saw a, a decline in, in uh, price. So our revenue to count for that year is $4,800. We take the difference of those two and we're looking at a $2,300, $2,350 indemnity. So to summarize things up as we get ready to wrap up, what are we looking at between whole farm and micro farm? There's pros and cons to both. So when we look at how many years of schedule F forms, micro farm, I have three versus whole farm at five, unless I'm a beginning or veteran farmer and rancher and I only have to have three as well. Micro farm includes those post-production or value added costs that we talked about where whole farm does not. Micro farm is a more streamlined approach and, and less paperwork. Um, that we see from Whole Farm, even though, like I said, with the expense reporting being um, excluded for the 2023 crop year, Whole Farm's getting better on, on a paperwork uh, perspective. However, when we start looking on the other side, Whole Farm uh, replant costs are included and, and, and covered. 
And then we can also allow those individual crop policies that buy up coverage levels are allowed where they are not in micro farm. And just in kind summary, of at that point right there, Ethan, I want to interject. When, when we're talking about those individual crop policies, so for example, in that previous one, apples and bees are both covered under a uh, under different other different policies. So, for example, on the apples, there's an APH and program actual production history. You, you you ensure your average production. You can also buy that policy with these with the whole farm policy, not the micro farm. And so that gives you know provided that uh, puts the uh, risk on just those apples, gives you a little more coverage there. And basically, if you have a loss on just your apples, that revenue from that insurance claim will go towards your whole farm and whether, you know, whether you had a loss or not. So um, just kind of a, since we're not covering those other policies, just wanted to step in and say, you know, these are, there are other policies out there that will cover apples and bees and, and you can carry both. Absolutely. Yes, there's a ton of different options available. And, and like I said, these are just, these are just two programs um, that we're highlighting today and, and essentially the biggest summary over these two that we can talk about is it's a safety net for all commodities located on your farm. Um, and it covers, like I said, if you produce a diversity of different, different crops and livestock, all those, we can bundle all those up, almost kind of an umbrella coverage, we can say, for all those commodities on your farm. Real quick, before we get started with resources, I wanted us to launch our last question of the evening, or afternoon, excuse me. So do you understand the procedures, deadlines, cost, and benefits to whole farm and micro farm programs? Um, answer whatever you think is, is, is applicable. I think this program, as, as we highlight and let those responses come in, I think it's one of those that there's a lot of different details that I think we could spend weeks upon weeks and, and I'm still learning as well, um, whole farm and micro farm. There's always something to learn. I've, I've figured out in the crop insurance rail, realm, excuse me, and something is changing all, all the time. Um, but I think we give you a little bit of an idea and, a, and a, some tools to utilize where maybe you can reach out to your crop insurance agent um, to talk about and see if, if whole farm and micro farm is something that's applicable to you or, or maybe not. Um, I think it's important that knowledge is empowerment. I think it's important to use those skills and make sure that we have the knowledge in order to see what, what we can utilize to mitigate that risk on our operations. I'll close the poll here and share. And as we can see, uh, three of us hot dogs, we got it all down. That, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm glad. Pl send us your resumes, please, as well, because we need all the help we can get on those. Um, and then most of us, like I said, I, I feel, yes, to an extent, I think we gave you a pretty good overview of Whole Farm. I hope we did. Um, but like I said, when we start, there's a lot of details and, and other elements required as well. We just wanted to get your mind stirred and, and see something that is available and also to see, like I said, maybe that what are the next steps? And that's what we're about to highlight here. Those next steps involve uh, the there's micro farm fact sheets and whole farm fact sheets that RMA publishes. They do a great job with this and you can look into those. They cover a pretty good overview similar to what we have covered. And then, like I said, your local crop insurance agent, Kim's highlighted it as well. There's an RMA, RMA publishes a locator tool uh, to determine what crop insurance agents are available in your area or closest to you. However, another good resource is your local farmers and ranchers. Those are great, great guys to talk to. They know, uh, the, they know have been involved with different agents and they can tell you and give you some direction. So those are some great resources to utilize as you continue on. Again, like we said, crop insurance agents are, need to have a heart of a teacher and, and are a great resource to utilize. So what are we looking at in our Winning at Risk Management series? We had our Crop Insurance 101 webinar that we talked about in January. And then in February and March, Kim, myself, and, and Maddie as well went to Tennessee, North Carolina, and then the great state of Texas here and uh, had those similar Crop Insurance 101 presentations. Today, thank you all again for attending. We have our whole farm revenue protection that we've highlighted. Then in about a month on April 27th, we're going to go into beekeeping. Uh, I, I wanted to say part B, beekeeping, and, and, and go with that. Now, more I was thinking about it, but we're going to talk about rainfall indexes, pasture, rangeland, and forage for our livestock guys, and then beekeeping as well. Like I said, 
will be highlighted in the second part of this series. Then we'll go into annual and perennial APH programs. Kim talked a lot about this. We'll talk about how the actual production history programs operate on a crop by crop basis. And then to wrap it all up, we'll wrap it up with different livestock programs. And some of these are going to overlap. Like I said, we talked about bees. We talked about livestock under whole farm. And we'll highlight a little bit about whole farm as well. And, and especially like part two and part four, we'll talk a little bit about it. Um, and like I said, some of these will overlap if you can attend and we'll publish those as well. And then to wrap up our presentations, uh, after we finish this webinar series, we're going to hopefully put together and release a Crop Insurance 101 and Winning at Risk Management modules that'll be available. We're hoping to break those up in little, you know, 30 second, one minute portions. Uh, that's kind of more of a training process to, that'll go a little more into detail and we'll add some more different programs. And that's where I wanted to emphasize, we're going to send out a post assessment, I believe will be sent through the farmer veteran group. And I think it's really good if you have something that you want to be included uh, under the training modules or maybe something that we can look at for future webinars that you want to know about from a risk management perspective, please give us your input. Um, we love the feedback and that helps us determine what, what is working well. Um, you can re respond and say, don't ask another question about peanut butter ever again. And so we, and we won't do that. Um, or, or man, we really love the Zoom questions and we'll make sure to add, keep adding those Zoom questions or maybe some different ideas that we have. Always looking to improve. And the biggest thing is, is to educate y'all guys, the farmers and ranchers that are providing for the food, fuel and fiber for the world in this great country that we live in. Again, I wanna say thank you for your time. Thank you for your service to our veterans. And I hope you've had some great insight and great information. And with that, we'll open up to any questions. And I'm also make sure Diego highlights the Farmer Veteran Coalition. And uh, with that, thank you very much again for your time. Good job, Ethan. Just a quick question that actually it was two and it was about livestock. And so I hesitate to answer questions on livestock because um, back to what Ethan was talking about, as far as your production, what you're producing in a year. So um, that would be something that we'll need to get a little more in depth in and not something that you can just say yes or no um, on that. So uh, uh, we'll try to put together some, a, a response, you know, but it, without specific information, that's one of those that's gonna be hard to answer, just a quick answer. Kind of thing. So. Yeah, that's that's one. Okay, of, I see the oh, predation, go ahead. oh, sorry, I was about to say that I see predation covered for livestock, mm -hmm. and then if or if they just drop mm -hmm. dead, mm -hmm. um, Kim highlighted those notes. Uh, predation is one of those that's interesting. Um, we'd have to dive a little more into whole farm. I, I would think as long as you can prove it, um, mm -hmm. there's some different elements that go into that. Um, because then, are we talking about breeding livestock? Or are we talking about the actual animals that we're selling? Mm -hmm. There is, we, we'll, we'll highlight this a little more in, in the livestock side, but there will be, there's some different options and available. Um, I will say if they just drop dead, I think there's going to be a reason behind that, any insurance. But they better have been struck by lightning. Y yes, it, it, <laughs> yeah, it, there, there needs to be a little bit of proof of what's going on. And, and that goes back, you know, uh, we hear, you know, I animal had respiratory disease. I gave them antibiotic, um, try to help them. And I vaccinated for, for you know, all the different types of respiratory diseases that are out there. Um, is, is that covered? Is it not? Um, I, I tend to think that as long as you're doing the best you can, it should be covered. Um, however, there's a lot of different things as Kim talked about that, that can go on. Yeah, we'll that. Get back we'll, on we'll, we'll stay stuff. tuned for, for part four of livestock programs and we'll <laughs> hit more on, on those different questions. Diego, I'm gonna turn the floor to you. Uh, yeah, so um, again, thank you everybody take for attending the webinar. Thank you to Ethan and Kim. They did a great job with the presentation. I love the pose, so keep it interactive. It was great. Um, as far as NBC, I'm just keeping it short and sweet, just so that I know everyone's busy. Just keep in touch with us. I'll be including my email inside the chat in case that anyone wants like the slideshow or anything. Just Shoot me an email and I'll send it to you by, I do need to edit it, but by next week I'll send it to you. Um, we have a lot going on FEC. This month's been crazy. Next month's will be even crazier on, and going on to the summer. To so stay in touch, follow us on Facebook. Um, keep in touch with AgriLogic as well. Mark your calendars for the next webinars because they will be great. But um, that's about all I got. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. Ethan, Kim, again, thank you so much. Um, 
and I'll see you next time.